The subject I want to uh, discuss with you today is food. And as has already been said, that means that we're all in. <laughs> and the relationship between farming practice, food quality, human and environmental health. And the issue and the question of what we can do to address the problem, which is that our food and farming systems over the last 50 or 60 years have become increasingly industrialized, intensive, and unsustainable, not in a fit state to pass on to our children and future generations. So the question arises what we can do about that. My credentials for speaking about this subject is that although I um, grew up in London, I had an urban background, by a stroke of good fortune in 1973, I was one of a member of six young, idealistic and arguably naive <laughs> people who became convinced that we were on the edge of um, an ecological breakdown and the only logical solution was to get back to the land and set up a, a rural community based on food self-sufficiency amongst other things. And as a result of that decision, um, really when I look back on it, uh, I think we were possessed with a kind of viral condition which was rather prevalent at that time, arguably still prevalent amongst young people, thank God, which is let's do it any sin anyway syndrome. Um, we took this decision, we set up the farm, uh, which was around 135 acres on a hill in West Wales, and from day one we decided to put our principles of sustainability into practice. So that meant no chemical fertilizers, pesticides, no routine use of um, antibiotics and other drugs, veterinary drugs, trying to build soil fertility through crop rotation, that sort of thing. Uh, we established a herd of 30 Ayrshire cows, uh, initially selling milk to the milk marketing board, and along the road um, we grew carrots from 1979 onwards, and I was, um, I first of all delivered the carrots to Crank's Restaurant and Whole Foods in London, and then latterly we packed carrots for supermarkets. In fact, the first carrot organic vegetables that Sainsbury's ever sold were packed in my cow shed. <laughs> and we also grew wheat, which we milled on the farm, and sold to a whole food shop in Aberystwyth, and then more recently my son Sam came back to the farm and is now turning all our milk from our expanded herd, we now have 75 Ayrshire cows, into a single farm cheddar style cheese made right adjacent to our milking parlour. And the happy accident of the commune, which sadly didn't last too long, I haven't got time to go into that, it's a fascinating human story there as you can imagine, <laughs> um, is that I had the great good fortune to enjoy a continuous relationship with this small hill farm in West Wales, <coughs> observing the long-term impact of practice and outcomes. And I would like to share some of the observations that I've derived from this over this 40-year period with you. And I think they're observations which may give rise to what I would call unifying principles, principles which could be applied to every farm, every food producer in the world of whatever scale continent, climate, you can imagine it rains a lot in Wales, but it doesn't matter because I think these, these principles are universal. And they relate to six areas. Soil, health, diversity, resilience, culture, and economics. On the soil front, I've come to conclude that the first and foremost responsibility of every food producer is not just to maintain, but to build soil fertility because it is on the, it's, in, it's depending on the fertility of the soil and the farmer's ability to maintain and build that, that the future of civilizations will depend. And we've done that on our farm by recycling nutrients and crop rotations, as I mentioned. And my observation is, really reflected through crop yields, is that over time it is possible not only to maintain, to build, but to build soil fertility. The second observation is about health, and I'd like to share two quotations with you to describe my philosophy on health. One is, 
um, we should regard pests, parasites and diseases as nature's professors of good husbandry because they reveal to us our management deficiencies. Now that's a hugely powerful idea uh, written by a man called Sir Albert Howard, a remarkable man who was around at the beginning of the last century, sent India to teach the Northwest Indian peasant farmers how to farm, had the humility to realize he had nothing to teach them because they were practicing truly sustainable agriculture and he realized their plants and their crops and the people themselves were vigorous and vital and didn't suffer from these pest and disease challenges even though they were all around them. And this idea of positive health is enormously powerful. The second quote, instead of treating the symptoms of disease, we should be investigating the causes of health. What a huge idea that is. And if you think about the National Health Service, better named the National Disease Treatment Service, or what's happened subsequently in agriculture during my involvement with farming, We've been all about treating symptoms and not promoting good health through sound management. And again, it's my experience that if you get the management right, and we haven't always got it right, the result is crops and livestock that can encounter pests and disease challenges, which will always be with us and still maintain positive health. The third area is diversity. I believe that if you farm with the grain of nature, it should be possible for biodiversity to coexist with respectable yields working in harmony and again our observation is that an incredible diversity of soil life of insects of birds small mammals can coexist with farming along sustainable principles and if only we could have a microphone in our farmyard right now the thing which would strike you would be the volume and the diversity of the bird song it always strikes me when i come back to the farm and Looking at the issue of nature, conservation and biodiversity, if you think about the modern conservation movement, global in scale, arguably owing its existence to Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which was published in 1962, the whole impulse of the conservation movement has been to protect nature against agriculture, not realizing that if we adopt that stance, nature will always be on the losing side because agriculture is the stronger force. And it seems to me that if we want to protect the last remnants of biodiversity throughout the world, what we really have to do is to change the way we farm. And again, I can say that that actually works because we haven't been practicing a lot of stewardship. We've simply been trying to do the right thing, working with the grain of nature. The, the next principle is the principle of resilience. Now, resilience could be defined as the capacity of an organism or a system to encounter change in the form of shocks and to continue to survive and develop and thrive. And if you think about our modern food systems that have become umbilically dependent on a whole range of outside inputs, they become really vulnerable to sudden shocks. So on our farm, what we're trying to do is to minimize our dependency on all these inputs. I'm talking here fossil fuels, we're, we're installing a range of renewable energy, uh, animal feed, instead of importing it, we're growing it on the farm, cattle bedding, we're baling the straw and the rush hay, seeds, we need to move in that direction as well, and then of course holistic grazing management, which is a key tool to building soil fertility, as I'm now investigating. So we're on a journey towards increasing the resilience of our farming system. Then the next observation is the importance of the cultural, cultural and social develop, uh, dimension. Because it seems to me that unless we can make farms of the future rich, rewarding places where you can have a strong sense of being and of quality of life, spiritual fulfillment as well as cultural and social richness, we're never going to be able to persuade a whole generation of young people who have gone to cities to come back to the land. And I had a conversation with my son Sam, who was in London, came back to the farm to make cheese and the other day and asked him if he regret, regretted his decision. And he said he didn't which is so gratifying. The last observation relates to the economics. And I want to devote the rest of this talk to that because when we first got to the farm, we were trying to farm sustainably, as I mentioned, but we were up against the common agricultural policy which subsidized every ton of grain, every liter of milk, and all our neighboring farmers were using, as they would, chemical inputs 
uh, in order to get maximum yields. And we had elected not to do that. We pretty soon found we were, we were making less money. So what we thought we'd do was write down a prescription for the application of sustainable principles, more or less on the back of the envelope. An envelope, and that became the drafts of the early organic standards. I was involved with writing the livestock standards. And then I spent most of the next 20 years of my life, this is after the first chapter of 10 years when I more or less never left the farm, in one way or another developing the organic market. And that's such, been such a huge success story on many levels. Peaked at around 2.6 billion in the UK in uh, 2008 and has declined since then, partly due to the recession. But looking at it another way, it's not been enough because we haven't broken through into the mainstream. I had a conversation with Michael Pollan a couple of years ago about looking at the size of the organic market and the local food market combined. And if you're really generous, it's about 5%. And that's not enough to break through into the mainstream and make all of our food systems uh, more resilient against future shocks, climate change, resource depletion, all the things that now everyone is talking about. And I've asked myself the question, why is that? And I think the reason is because the polluters not paying, and farmers who are trying to practice right practice are not getting properly rewarded for what they do. And to best illustrate this issue, I want to talk about what we're calling true cost accounting by referring you to a conversation I had with my mum a couple of weeks ago. I go and have supper with my parents in Bath whenever I can, and on this occasion we were talking about Hugh Fernley Whittingstall's chicken run and his iconic campaign to persuade the council residents of his nearby town, which of course is down the road from here, to pay double as much for a chicken with a good sustainable story. And how he'd failed to do that. And I was lamenting to my mum, I said, you know, it's what a shame that he couldn't persuade them to pay double as much, and in the end they ended up buying the cheaper birds. Well, said my mum, is in a, she's in her 94th year, but she's still pretty sharp, and she, she knows how to sort of get to the point. She said, well, they would, wouldn't they? buy the cheaper bird because they're in a position where price matters and that's what they've got to do. So I responded saying, yeah, I know that mum, but think about this. If all the hidden costs associated with the production of that bird, the destruction of the rainforest, the loss of soil, the erosion, the pollution from the nitrates and the pesticides, the emissions which are causing climate change, the transportation right across the Atlantic of the soil and the um, maize which the birds, the, the intensive chickens are eating, the social costs of the disappearance of the small family farms and the health costs like antibiotic resistance of previously, uh, against previously uh, strong drugs, uh, for instance MRSA which ironically my mother had a hip operation which get, went wrong precisely because of that. I said if you factored all those costs into the equation, the Tesco £2.50 chicken wouldn't be cheap at all. So my mum wasn't finished with me yet, she said oh that's interesting. She said, so tell me, what would the price of the Tesco chicken be if you added all those costs in? And of course I had to say I didn't know. <laughs> but I had a recovery line, which was that I'm on the case to find out because the next week, now last week, I told her I'm going to Kentucky, to Louisville in Kentucky, to participate in a meeting which my new organisation, the Sustainable Food Trust, had helped organise, which will bring together, brought together, 50 leading researchers, scientists, policy makers and funders to investigate these external costs, that's what uh, economists call them, damaging consequences of our present industrial food system to identify them, the emissions, the depletion of natural resource capital, the human health impact, the biodiversity. Secondly, to put a price on it. And thirdly, to think about how we can develop policy instruments whereby the polluter would pay at source and the people who are farming in a more sustainable, sustainable way would benefit from the, the outcomes which deliver benefits to society. Now this is a huge programme and it's not going to be accomplished overnight. But I give you this commitment that I will spend uh, as much energy as I possibly can in following this through because it seems to me that unless we get true cost accounting applied into our food and farming systems, we're never going to get the transition that's required in the time available to move on to a more sustainable footing for all our food. So this gives rise to a question, because if that's the case, and it's going to be a process in time with lots of political barriers, as you can imagine, what are we going to do in the meantime? What are you going to do in the meantime, and me? So I, I want to offer you this, because 
the relentless juggernaut of intensive agriculture is still getting worse. There are fewer and fewer farmers, processors, distributors, packers, abattoirs, and retailers responsible for an ever greater proportion of the food we buy, and mostly the story behind its production you wouldn't want to know if you found out. So what can we do against this huge force which is not in the public interest at the moment? Here's my suggestion. What we should do is we should change our buying specification for our key staple foods from this day on. So think about the temperate staple foods that you buy on a regular basis, the vegetables, the salads in season of course, the cereals and the grain products, flour and breakfast cereals, the dairy products, the eggs, the fresh meat. Go into your local supermarket. I'm sure many of you have, are on box schemes or community supported agriculture programs, but you're not the people I want to address this to. <laughs> Set this as your buying specification. Only buy your staple foods from producers who are local, regional, or at least national, and whose identity, or at least the story of production, is known to you, and as sustainable as possible. Certified, perhaps, or not need to be certified, if you, if you know the story, if it's personally available to you. Now, if you try to do that, you set that specification, and try and fill your shopping bag according to that specification. I predict that you'll find it difficult. But don't give up. Go to the customer services desk. Tell them your story. Tell them about your newfound enthusiasm for sustainable food sourcing and ask them if they can oblige by changing their offer. And if they don't come up with the goods, take your customer elsewhere. Now, if everybody involved in this meeting and anybody else who comes across these issues took that action, this would be the key to achieving the radical transformation that is needed to our food systems. Because in the end, my farm's like an organ in the wider food system. We've had talks about that already today. But the ultimate cells of the food system are individual citizens. You are the most powerful people. It is your actions scaled up which will transform our present unhealthy systems into a, a healthy and resilient alternative. So it really matters what you do. If you take action, scale up, the world will change, and you will have taken collectively a vital step in delivering the more sustainable food systems that we need for the future. So that is the issue that I wanted to share with you this afternoon. I'd like you to to thank you for listening, but I'd like to thank you a whole lot more if you decide to take action along the lines that I've just suggested. Thank you very much.